Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Woe. So, Mission Marple rolls on today with the moving finger. This was a first read for me, so that's always exciting. And before we dive in, just a reminder to folks that Mission Marple is mostly a spoiler-free project, so I am rereading all of the Miss Marple books in the order of their original publication, uh, starting with The Murder at the Vicarage, and we'll just keep on trucking until we're at the end. I do, like I said, I keep these mostly spoiler free. So the first section is a synopsis of the plot, roundabouts to where we find a body. We'll talk about characters, including character details. And I will give you some of my impressions of the themes. If you consider any of that to be spoilers, be ye warned. Then we will transition into a fully spoilery part of the review where I make no representations. I will feel free to spoil anything in this book and anything in the Christie oeuvre. So with that being said, let's dive on in because I actually have to kind of get to getting today, so I, I won't have as much time to really dig in, but that's just how it goes. The Moving Finger takes place in a little fictitious town called Limestock that is, I think we're meant to believe someplace kind of like Dartmoor in England. And uh, in this little town, you know, it's got all the villagers, whatnot, that we've come to expect from these sort of quaint marble settings. We've got, we've got all that going. We've got like a vicar, we've got lawyers, we've got like all the normal townspeople. And to this town comes a brother and a sister, Jerry and Joanna Burton. Jerry was injured in a flying accident. And this is set, I think, pretty much in 1940 or 41. So I think we're meant to maybe infer that this has something to do with World War II, not totally sure. Um, but there's not really a lot of direct allusions to the outside world in this or the kind of geopolitical situation, so who knows. But they move to this little town to let Jerry recuperate. He gets a lot of advice from doctors about how he should just like immerse himself in village life and be drawn in by the gossip and just rest his mind and body and, and let himself heal. So uh, they settle in starting to do this, but lo and behold, pretty darn quick, uh, they start getting word of these really nasty anonymous letters that are going around. And when I say nasty, I mean like they are like vile, vulgar, really like hardcore uh, poison pen letters or like anonymous notes that basically are just insinuating terrible things. So like the one that the Burtons get, and I should mention Jerry Burton is our narrator, um, says that he and Joanna are not brother and sister, that they are actually lovers. And like, it says gross things about what they're doing together. So that's kind of the setup. And a lot of different people are getting these and everyone's kind of trying to speculate who might be sending them and why and all that stuff. And it kind of comes to a boil when the local lawyer's wife ends up committing suicide after she receives a note that says basically that her second son was not um, fathered by her husband. And it's a little weird because it was kind of the insinuation was so out of nowhere. It wasn't credible uh, and she was otherwise a very stable person. So people are kind of like, I mean, they, they believe it's a suicide, but it's also just sort of like a little weird, the whole scenario. Um, so that happens and, and other people are getting other pen letters. It's, it's kind of escalating, getting nasty. There's a lot of sort of goings on with the townspeople that I don't want to get into because I think it'd be a little spoilery. But suffice it to say, eventually we do start having more bodies pile up and Jerry is kind of trying to get to the bottom of things. And you may be thinking to yourself, sweetheart, you've not mentioned Miss Marple yet. Well, it's funny how that goes because Miss Marple does not come into this book until like basically the end. Like pretty much this is a marvelous book. Mostly we're dealing with the burdens. So let me get into my thoughts about this. And most of my thoughts are pretty spoilery. So uh, I am going to start with some overall thematic comments then we'll transition to spoilers. My overall impression of this book is that I think that the mystery itself, like the setup of it is really intriguing. It's an interesting idea for a murder plot, like a murder mystery plot. So I, I like that bit. Uh, I like how it ends up being resolved. I think that's interesting. Like I was invested in the actual plot of this. Uh, I also liked, you know, the general tone. I always like a Christie tone, but I really had a very hard time connecting with the characters in this one. And because so much of what you're coming to a Christie for, at least for me, is bound up in characters, I will say that this just wasn't really one of my favorites. Um, I think I ended up giving it a 3.5 star. And again, it just boils down to, I, I wasn't invested in these characters. I found Jerry and Joanna to be just like judgmental and really unpleasant to spend time with and considering he's the narrator, that's kind of a problem. I really didn't like their attitude towards Meg Symington, um, who is ultimately like Jerry's love interest. I don't think that's too much of a spoiler, like that gets set up pretty quickly. 
I wasn't into that. I mean, Joanna by the end and kind of how she's dealing with some of the like romantic intrigue in her life kind of redeems herself a little bit for me, but like I just really didn't enjoy their attitude towards her. I thought, I don't know, I just, the characters in this I really had a hard time getting along with and therefore I, I didn't really enjoy this one as much as I normally do and definitely not as much as I have been the last few. Also, as I alluded to, the fact that Miss Marple is hardly in this, I find to be like just really galling and frustrating and just not like, I want Miss Marple to be in my Marple book. Like, I, I think I pretty much had the same critique about several of the Poirots where I just really got frustrated that it's supposed, it's ostensibly a Poirot book and then he doesn't show up till the end. This is ostensibly a Marple book. She doesn't show up to the end. I think that this would have been much better served just being one of the standalones and not a Miss Marple book. This gets back to the discussion, the kind of ongoing discussion we've been having of how Christie herself thought Marple worked best in short story. I think that this is a great example of that because by the time you introduce Marple often, uh, it's a little anticlimactic because she just figures things out so quickly. And so I don't know, I just really, I struggled with this in terms of it as a Marvel book and, and not liking the characters I did have to spend time with. So like I said, I gave it a 3.5 star of, I've essentially been ranking these so far in descending order. So my favorite so far has been The Murder of the Vicarage, then The 13 Problems, then The Body in the Library, and then this one, The the Moving Finger. So, you know, I remember A Murder is announced quite fondly, so I'll be interested to see how I do with it. So we'll see if I can break that streak. But in terms of my non-spoilery thoughts, I don't have a lot of them because mostly I would just tell you that I think the characters in this didn't work for me. So with that being said, let me transition into the main thing I wanna talk about, which is spoilery. This book definitely supports my ongoing like hypothesis that the entire Marple oeuvre is basically thematically just about supplemented female rage and men's perception of female anger. I just found that interplay in this so fascinating. So basically everybody in this book is assuming that the poison pen writer is a woman because only a woman would be interested in this kind of gossip and would even think to kind of do this. And what Miss Marple's insight is, is that these poison pen letters don't ring true to the kind of like cruelty that women would exhibit towards each other, but rather what men would uh, think would be cruel to a woman. And that's how she realizes that the po poison pen writer is a man. And then she kind of comes to, you know, the solution of, you know, the tried and true, the husband did it once she kind of figures that out. So I thought just like the discussions, the overt discussions in this book about women and their anger and how they express it, I thought were fascinating and ripe for feminist uh, readings. There's a lot of sort of back and forth in terms of like, I think we have a tendency to want to say, like, I don't know, I think in general, we want to just be able to say like, this author is good, or this author is problematic, or this author is like feminist or not like, people are more complicated than that. And especially in this time period with a woman who was in her, let's say 50s or 60s, 50s, I guess, by the time this was being written, and who I think had just a very interesting relationship with her own gender identity, uh, reading back into it. I think that we can't expect a lot of consistency in her characterization, but I think that you can make arguments in this book for both a feminist and non-feminist reading in terms of like Christie's authorial attitude. I think there's some really interesting discussions around Amy Griffith and her kind of sense of self-determination as a woman in her profession and, and her kind of speaking to that. I think the contrast between sort of the urbane Joanna versus the more like country Megan, I think there's some interesting parallels there um, that could be read as both good and bad. The parts of this book that like actually repulsed me were <laughs> around the whole like Pygmalion-esque makeover of Megan and how like that made her desirable and worthy and whatever, like that made me wanna barf and therefore I couldn't really ever get on board with their love story. Even though obviously like a lot of our sympathy is meant to be kind of driving towards there, like we're supposed to be rooting for them to get together and I just like, didn't like that. I really, I liked how Joanna came out and her relationship because I think she showed a lot of spunk and sort of like showed that she had grown and changed in her responses to the local village life by the end of it. So I liked that. And I do, I, you know, I enjoyed like with my, my 21st century lens on it, I definitely enjoyed like Megan being portrayed as like spunky and like having a lot of courage at the end. One comment that I've seen a couple of times is like, well, you can't judge historical um, books outside of their context. Like these were the attitudes of the time and we just kind of have to be okay with that. 
And I think that that's true to an extent. I think you absolutely have to take historical context into account. That being said, Agatha Christie herself has demonstrated the ability, even in the 20s and 30s, to be very sympathetic to what we would describe as like very pro-woman or feminist type characters. Like she has written those in the past and she has shown an authorial attitude that's very sympathetic to being not misogynist, basically. Um, So I think it's fair to point out the times when she chooses not to be sympathetic to her characters, her female characters in that way. I think some of the discussions that she has around different types of sins that the women in the local community have committed, you know, they're, they gross me out. And, and she may be channeling that voice specifically to get in the mindset of village life. That might be kind of the choice she's making, but I also feel like it's fair to say that we've seen her make not that choice, especially in urban environments. And, and maybe that's now that I'm kind of talking this through, maybe that really is the distinction she's making kind of in the Marble versus Poirot books, because I'm finding there's a lot of sort of like subtextual things that I think of as being very sympathetic to like women having power and being underestimated. I think Marple herself is sort of a subtextual embodiment of this idea of like, you discount women who society discounts at your peril in an Agatha Christie book, because they often like know more, see more, are capable of more than what you're gonna guess. So like, I think subtextually, there's a lot of that happening, but on the text of the novel, there's a lot of overt misogyny. Sometimes it's undercut, sometimes it's not. But again, I do think it's fair to call out when that's happening because she herself comments on it to some degree or other in other books. And I think she herself is aware of it. So it's fair for us to sort of like, assess her her kind of attitude towards it and and in just talking right now i think maybe where i'm landing is that a part of the sort of like authorial voice she assumes in the marple world in the marple verse is one of a small village that isn't very sympathetic to women working or um you know being having any kind of self-determination or being overtly feminist or overtly like progressive or whatever um, and maybe because it's just that that village life, that's the voice she's taking on. Whereas with Poirot, I think we see a lot more mixed um, kind of textual descriptions of women. So I know I've been talking about like feminist readings of this a lot, but that really in this reread is like what is just like blaring out to me. So like that's what I'm interested in. Um, and because there's not a lot of like geopolitical stuff happening that it kind of doesn't have anything vying for my attention. This is where my interest lies apparently in this reread. So there you go. But yeah, I guess I don't have a ton to say about this one. Hope that's okay. Um, Like I said, mostly it kind of just left me hot and cold because there were things I really liked about it. And there were things that I was really ambivalent about. Um, I do think thematically, this was one of the most interesting ones I've read for either of these projects, just in terms of like the overt discussion of gender roles and and unpacking what that means in 1940s life. Yeah, fascinating um, in that respect. So definitely a fruitful read. And yeah, we'll see how I do next week with the murders announced. So definitely let me know what you guys thought of the moving finger below or in the Goodreads group. I have the name of that in the description. Feel free to head over to those forums and chat with other people who are doing the reread. But yeah, I think that will do it for me for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that that will do it. I hope you guys are having a really lovely day and I will just talk to you soon. Bye.